with me to Acts chapter 10. And thank you, Carson, for singing Be Thou My Vision. We've been doing this, uh, we just started last week this series on heavenly vision, uh, talking about here in Acts chapter 10 how God really opens up the eyes to, to Cornelius and then also there to Peter. So um, I told you, I've told you before that for about 10 years we traveled around and did traveling ministry with a ministry called No Longer Quiet, played music and led Bible studies. It was often our practice that we would, after leading worship, we'd get to go into homes and do Bible studies with some of the, the kids there. And so I would uh, do various Bible studies but one of the things I would commonly do is ask the kids to tell their story. Tell me about how you came to follow Christ. And so they would tell stories, and you know how youth are. Sometimes you get the class clown in the room, and so there's this one kid that's just always making jokes, so whenever it comes to him, he says, I got, str- uh, I got saved because the Lord struck me with lightning. And so I laugh, like, that's pretty funny. And he goes, no, that, that wasn't a joke. And he takes his hair and leans it over and shows me the scar, And then he pulls up or pulled down his sock and showed me where it came out of his ankle. He said he was at youth camp and had heard the gospel, was thinking about that, but didn't respond. The next night, it was his uh, cabin's turn to do the dishes. And so it was like six, you know, sixth grade boys, sixth grade girls got to clean up the cabin or clean up the, the mess hall there. And so he said he was doing dishes, had his hands in the water, lightning struck the building, came through, hit the girl next to him and hit him. And she just had minor damages, but he said he woke up three days later in the IC unit, and he said, first thing I did was ask Jesus into my heart. And then I was like, yes, the Lord got your attention, man. That's pretty good. So when we think about heavenly visions, there are those times that this is, Acts chapter 10 is kind of like God striking the church and saying, this goes to all people. This, it's the time that he just makes it abundantly clear that this is not just for the Jewish people. This is for all people. Now, that's not the only way that God speaks. I, I'm very grateful that God has not struck me with lightning. There's other ways that he leads us. And so last week we talked about why does this happen in Acts 10? Because if we go back to Acts chapter 8, we saw that Philip, the evangelist, is there in Caesarea. So why is it that uh, Cornelius didn't just simply hear Philip preaching? And it is because God's going to make this abundantly clear. And so we talked last week about what it is for Cornelius, how he kind of saw what the will of God was. We asked this question last week, how open does a door have to be for you to say, I think we should walk through it? I think this is what the Lord is calling us to do. And so for Cornelius, this angel appears and says, here's the door that I'm opening, go and ask for Peter. And then we ask this question for each of us, uh, ourselves as followers of Christ, knowing that we're called to walk by faith, how is it that we do that? And we ended last week with this illustration uh, of the le- what were called leading lights, and it was from F.B. Meyer, and he said that as he was entering a harbor once, and there were some, some rough waves, and they knew it was a pretty shallow harbor, and so he said, how do we know we're in the channel? And, he, and the captain of that ship said, well, it's these leading lights. When these lights align, you know your boat is setting in the middle of the channel, so you've got safe passage. So F.B. Myers went on to say that for the Christian, the believer, that here's the three lights that you have. You have the Word of God that lines up with the desire of your heart that lines up with an open door or circumstances. So that's a way that we could say, hey, we're in the will of God. So that was the message last week. And then I got a message this week. And just to let you know, this is where we're headed. But Elijah, uh, joining us online, he said that I love the message, but what happens when you don't have the desire? Because we realize that's an opportunity, right? That our hearts are, are insanely wicked, that they're very deceptive. In fact, your, your heart is so deceitful that sometimes it will even deceive itself. You, you don't even know that you're lying to yourself sometimes. Sometimes I don't even know that the, the thoughts that are entering my head are not the truth because I, I feel like they're safe, they're from me. And so what happens when the Word of God aligns with an open door, but yet you don't have the desires, And that's exactly where we're going to find Peter in this story. We could go and look at Jonah and say Jonah is a great example of that, that the Lord has clearly spoken, the Lord has opened these doors, and yet Jonah ran from the Lord. And so the question today is, what happens uh, whenever you, where godly vision ends, whenever the vision ends and, and you're left in the spot to say, that's just not the desire of my heart. So we're going to pick up here in Acts chapter 10. If you would stand in honor of reading God's word, uh, word. we're going to start there in verse 1. Acts chapter 10, verse 1. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion, in what is known as the Italian regiment. And he and all of his family were devout and God-fearing, and he gave generously to those in need, and he prayed to God regularly. One day, about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. 
he distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. And Cornelius stared at him in fear and said, What is it, Lord? And he said, The angel answered, Your prayers and your gift to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa and bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the tanner, whose house is by the sea. And the angel who spoke to him was gone. Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was, with, was one of his attendants. And he told them everything that had happened, and he sent them to Joppa. And now about noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, city, Peter went up on the rooftop to pray. And he became hungry, and he wanted something to eat. And while his meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. And he saw heaven open and something like a large sheet being let down to the earth by its four corners. It contains all kind of animals, four-footed animals, as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. And the voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, and the men sent to him by Cornelius found where Simon's house was, and they stopped at the gate. And they called out, asking if Simon, who is known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, Three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs, and do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. And Peter went down and said to the men, I am the one you are looking for. Why have you come? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, I thank you that your word is, it truly is supernatural. Father, I, I thank you for the way that your word affects our minds. I thank you, Father, that it's your word that, that often you use to stir in our hearts with your Holy Spirit. And Father, we simply ask that you do that here today, that for each person that's here, whether they believe in you and your word or not, Father, I pray that your spirit would move in accordance to your word. Father, I pray that for those who are believers, that you would draw them closer to you. Would you use this message, Father, to challenge us and to help us walk in obedience to you. Lord, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, let's uh, talk a little bit about this vision. First, you see Peter uh, and Cornelius are both people of prayer. That's kind of a neat similarity between the two of them, and that's really about where it ends, because beyond that, they're going to take two different approaches to the whole situation. Both of them received their vision while they were praying. We've been asking that the Lord would stir in our hearts, that we would be a people of prayer. You have Peter, who, whenever he was following Christ, said, Lord, teach us to pray. And now you have Peter in the middle of the day spending time in prayer, and that's important because for a Jewish person, there's normally two times during the day that were kind of calls to prayer, that they would pray, and there was a time of prayer in the morning and one in the evening. So at noonday, he's going to spend some time in prayer. He goes up to the rooftop, I assume, because it's kind of a a place where he can be alone, have a clear mind, and uh, be without distractions. He's hungry, and in this moment of hunger, he sees this sheet being dropped down that is filled with all of these animals. So whenever it says it's these animals, it was neat to to hear that somebody's going to be uh, going into ag. I, I uh, took one ag class and uh, enjoyed that a lot, but I know in ag you, you have all of these different testing that you'd go up for the competitions and say this is what a good animal is and this is what a bad animal is. And so if we could just put it in common terms, there's good animals and bad animals in here. Maybe a clear way to say it to everyone is the game of paper, rock, scissors. You're familiar with paper, rock, scissors. Now some people play paper, rock, scissors and they do a rhythm to it. I don't know how you do it. Some people just go one, two, three, shoot. Some people don't say shoot, some people just one, two, three, do it. And then there are some that say paper, rock, scissors, show me what you got, uh, and then shoot. So my strategy, just to let you know what it is, is one, two, three, let me see what you did, and I'm the other one. Yes, right? So here's one universal thing that we know in the game of paper, rock, scissors, is that scissors beats what? Paper. And we know that paper beats what? And we know that rock beats what? So here, let me just simplify the Jewish thought here for you. Of all the complexities of food, here's what they knew, is that unclean always beats clean. So if you have something that is unclean and something that is clean, and the unclean touches the clean, the clean now becomes unclean. 
So this is the thought for, for a Jewish person is that whenever Peter sees this sheet that's falling down and it's got clean and, clean and unclean in it, it means everything's unclean. I'm not going to eat any of that because it's all been polluted. This is his thought. However, he should have known better because uh, while Peter was running with Jesus, whenever he's following him, there is a time that Peter, along with the other apostles, get caught doing something that all of our parents would, would be upset with us for. He comes to the dinner table without washing his hands. Oh, the tragedy of this. I know none of you have ever done this before. I can tell you I used to work at Sasco um, paving and sealing down here, and you would get this tar on your hand, and we would sometimes at lunch break, uh, you know, get McDonald's. And I don't know what is in McDonald's fries that was a better cleaner than the, the fast orange that we would use to wash our hands. You'd wash your hands, and they just still look disgusting. And then you'd eat fries, and at the end of the meal, you'd look at your fingers, fingers and the tips of them were clear, and you're like... I wonder where that went, you know. <laughs> so you, uh, it, it, was, it was just kind of a, a very real expression here. But here's what happens with disciple, uh, the, Peter the disciple and the other disciples is that they sat down for a meal and the Pharisees are watching and the Pharisees, always looking for a good accusation, they say, look, your disciples didn't wash their hands. And you know, you're really digging for some dirt on somebody if that's what you're bringing to the table is they didn't wash their hands. And so Jesus there in Mark chapter seven begins to have this conversation with them about what actually makes something clean and unclean. And, and so Jesus actually there in Mark seven, he says, it's not something that you put inside your mouth that makes you unclean because when you put something in your mouth and you eat it, it actually goes to your stomach. And Jesus says, it's actually in your heart that makes you clean or unclean. And so he's describing this to them, and he says, it's, so it's not what the food is. And there's actually a verse there that says, Jesus there is saying that it's not the food that is clean or unclean. Peter should have remembered this story, but if not that story, he should have at least remembered that there was a total change with Jesus because in all the times of ra being raised, the Jewish person knew that if unclean touches clean, it becomes unclean. But that's not what happens with Jesus, because with Jesus, there's a leper that comes, and Jesus touches him, and the leper becomes clean. You see, it's a total change. It, this was mind-blowing to think, wait a minute, the unclean just touched the clean, but that made them clean. And there's a woman who's got a bleeding issue, and she actually kind of breaks the societal rules there. She enters the crowd, which she was not supposed to be a part of, and she sneaks through the crowd, reaches up, and touches the hem of Jesus' cloak, and she becomes clean. Jesus turns around and says, who touched me? You remember the story, and it's this thought that the, now it's, it's totally different, that if Jesus touches something unclean, it becomes clean. Peter totally misses this vision. Here's what these animals represent. It's people, right? Clean and unclean. But he misses it. Here's the other part that I believe that Peter misses, is that this is being let down, and it's specific whenever it gives the detail, that it's being let down by the four corners. Now, if you'll think for a second, the four corners, what does this represent? There's a um, prophecy in Isaiah, I believe it's Isaiah chapter 11, that says that God is going to draw back from the four corners of the earth uh, all those who belong to him. That's Isaiah chapter 11. Now, if you've ever looked at a globe and you've graduated, we're not flat earthers, and I do not believe the Bible is a flat or earther. So whenever we say four corners, the smart aleck in the room says it's a globe. There aren't four corners. And we would respond to that, man, I'm out of breath. I got to start working out. Whew. Get all worked up. What are the four corners? The four corners are the north, south, east, and west, right? And so in a similar way, the sheet is being let down by these four corners, and it's representing a harvest. It's representing this group of both clean and unclean that are being brought in. And Peter should be remembering this. There should be some verses that are popping into his mind about, that's right, this is the God of the harvest. This is the God who wants to draw all men to himself. Psalms 82, all the nations are your inheritance. Psalm 67, all the families of the earth will worship you. Going back to Genesis, the promise to Abraham was that through Abraham, he would bless who? All the nations of the earth. God has always had a desire for all people. All the way to Zechariah chapter 8. Zechariah chapter 8 says, it's a really cool passage, verse 32. It says that the foreigner will grab the cloak of the Jew and say, let me come with you to worship your God. You know, Peter should be thinking about all this as this is being dropped down and the clean and the unclean are coming on the four corners of a sheet that's gathering them. But instead, we see Peter's problem. Peter's problem is that he has what some would call diarrhea of the mouth. He just can't stop talking. I, I have this sickness. I, 
I thought that maybe diarrhea was inappropriate, but does anybody else have that? Maybe you know somebody like this. I just habitually will fill silence with my own words. Scripture says we should be quick to listen and slow to speak, but Peter is the one who will always fill the void of silence. And so it's the song of a sinful mind. Just keep talking. I heard one uh, politician who said this that I thought was kind of funny. He said, if your horse is dead, at least dismount. At least stop trying to ride it. Like, you're going to have to learn at some point this is not working. But for Peter, he still hasn't learned to just be quiet for a moment. So what does Peter do in this vision that the heavens open, this... um, you know, cloth is being dropped down with the clean and the unclean animals in it. It's being dropped in front of them, and Peter responds in two ways. He says, surely not, and then secondly, he says, I have never. So let's just talk about these. Number one is he is in opposition to the Lord. There's a couple ways that you see this looking back through Peter's life. First, the very first time that he was in opposition to the Lord where he just got, you imagine this, if you're ever correcting Jesus or correcting God you're the one that's in the wrong. But Peter kind of felt like he maybe had the position to go to Jesus and tell him never. The first one is there in Matthew chapter 16. It says that Jesus began to explain to them that he was going to be crucified and raised on the third day. And you remember there, Matthew chapter 16, Peter says, "Um, Jesus, love the teaching, great sermon today. Just could we step over here to the side for a moment? I just have one thing to tell you. Never, never, Lord, I'm not going to let that happen to you. Do you remember this, Matthew? You don't remember this? Don't recall the story, maybe? Uh, And so Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me, and you don't have the mind of the things of God, but the things of men. What is it that he's opposing to right here? He's standing in opposition to Jesus's mode of salvation. See, Peter didn't have a problem with Jesus saving us. He had a problem with how he was going to save us. You're going to die? You're going to be crucified? You're going to leave? Peter's saying, no, no, that's not how we're going to do it. You're the best friend I've ever had. I've never seen miracles like what I've seen with you. You've got to stay. We're not going to let it happen this way. So Peter is standing in opposition to Jesus' mode of salvation. Secondly, you see him stand in opposition to Jesus' model of service. You fast forward to John chapter 13 now. It's right after the Lord's Supper, um, or perhaps before I... Don't remember exact order here, but Jesus, yeah, it's afterwards because he gets up, he wraps himself, and then he begins to wash their feet. And what is it that Peter says to this? Never again. Here's the never word. Never, Lord, you won't wash my feet. And Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, I don't have a part with you. And then Jesus, so Peter responds to that by saying, well, then bathe all of me. Just, just give me a bath. And you got to think Jesus is like, Peter, good night, man. Just stop talking. Like, it, what's the old saying? It's better to be thought a fool than to open your mouth and to prove everyone correct. Like, Peter, just be quiet. I'm washing your feet. And, but Peter's in opposition. He's saying, no, no, you'll never serve me. It, it's a thought of pride, isn't it? He, he is opposing the model that Jesus wants to give them to say, this is how you're going to serve. You're going to be a servant of all. You're going to be a pastor to the pastors. You're going to, you, you want to be the servant to everyone. And he goes on to teach him that a servant's not greater than his master. And then number three right here, he's in opposition to Jesus' mission of assimilation. And the mission of assimilation is that Jesus now is going to draw this harvest of all mankind. And you have Peter, who's supposed to be in many ways the, uh, the leader of this ragtag group. And he's saying, surely not, Lord. Surely not. We're not going to do this. I like what uh, Dr. W. Graham Scroggy said about this. He said, these are words you can't use. We can say no, and we can say Lord, but we cannot say no, Lord. If he's truly Lord, then you can only say yes and obey his commands. The whole thought of Lord means that he's commander. It means that he's in control. It means that you've submitted your will. So the fact that Peter says, no, Lord, is an oxymoron. He's saying, no, Lord, we can't do this. Now, I want you to pause for just a second and ask this question. Do you ever find yourself in opposition to God's will? Do you ever find yourself saying, no, Lord, that's not how we're going to do it? Here is the leader of the early church who's doing this. I think each one of us could fall into this trap at some point to be the ones that say, no, Lord, that's not how we're going to do it. Peter surely did, and I know I have as well. If the devil is good enough to deceive angels that angels were part of the fall, he could surely deceive you and me. 
how often we could stand in opposition to say, no, Lord, that's not how we're going to do. One of the main goals we have as a believer is to go to the Lord and say, whatever you want, I'll do. Now, the second part of Peter's problem is that he not only says, uh, no, Lord, but he also says, I have never. Now, this is an absolute statement. At no point, here's what it means whenever you say never. It means at no point past, present, or future. This will not happen. It's, it hasn't happened. It ain't going to happen. Uh, this is the mistake we often make, is that we begin to assign to ourselves attributes that only God has. So if you think about theologians, whenever they discuss the attributes of God, they'll normally begin by breaking it down into two categories. So here would be the two categories. One category is there's no one like you, and the other category would be, be emulators of God. So the two ways you could look at it, the way that God is like nothing else and no one else, and then the, there are ways that we could relate to him. For example, God is father, and I too am a father. Now, I'm not as good of a father, clearly, as God is, and there's different attributes there, but I, I could relate to that, right? God is love, and I too could be loving, right? Right? God is jealous. There's an attribute we don't talk about very often, but I too could be jealous. But then there are some attributes of God that we cannot share. These are things that we don't have. For example, to be all-knowing. There's never a situation where we're all-knowing, but we all know the know-it-all, right? The person where you could never tell them something. You say, hey, have you ever heard of this author? I read this. Oh, yeah, yeah, I read a lot of books. Oh, sure, you've read you know, a lot of their books. Like, you just can't ever tell them news. You call them to say, hey, did you hear so-and-so pregnant? Yeah, yeah, I heard that. Yeah, you just heard it because I heard like told. You know, like, they just drive you crazy because they're the know-it-all. And what they've done is they've idolized themselves to say, I have an attribute that only God could have. And I'll tell you, one of the worst ones we do this with is God's immutability. Immutability basically just means that God will not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's a great attribute to have because it means that we're not, we're not chasing after shifting sands. We, we, we have a solid rock. We have something that's stable because in our world, we don't have stability but we all long for it. And so often we use these attributes, these, these absolute statements about ourselves to say, I never, this is just the way I am. You know what that statement ultimately means? I'm immutable. I'm not going to change. I've never done that. I never will do it. And praise the Lord that he's in the business of changing people, especially people who think they won't change. Now, if I could just maybe bring this down to a lower level, here's this. People would say, man, I'd never preach. Oh, that's a big word. Never to a God who just enjoys that challenge, right? I, man, I'm not the type of person who would just go invite somebody to church or get into that conversation. Well, hold on, brother. Buckle up because you're about to meet the God who loves the nevers, making them the always. There was once a guy who died and they said, when you die, you just stay dead. And Jesus said, don't say never to me. whoop come on up, Lazarus right? He's just that way. Man, that's good. He is immutable, and yet here's Peter saying, never, never going to do that. Not going to happen. And you see within the end of the chapter, it, he's going to be doing that. Let me read this quote for you. It's a little bit lengthy, but this is from Jen Wilkins in her book, No One Like You, talking about the attributes of God. And she says this, our sadness or frustrations that we feel about changes to something that we believe to be unchanging reveals our tendency to ascribe what is true only of God to people, possessions, and circumstances that are not Him, to expect earthly places and people to be immutable. I tell myself that my love of routine and aversion to change is really just my longing for God who does not change. But if I was honest, I would say that it's plain idolatry. In truth, I'm telling temporary changing things, I need you to be more like God. Please just stay the same. When we apply these terms like always or never to other people, we're speaking lies. These words can only be spoken of God. Just as my assurance of salvation rests in the fact that God does not change, my hope of sanctification rests in the fact that I can change. Isn't that good? You think about how many marriages, this, you'll hear this as if it's an excuse. They just changed. You don't think you changed? I mean, that's just a common attribute of people. Look in the mirror. 
I, every time I go to the barber, I think, man, they're just cutting the gray hairs, they, you know, or, or the black hairs. Like, what happened? It's because I've changed. Facebook now identifies me as Kenny Proctor, my dad. I just look older. And praise the Lord, Dawn likes it. That's just a great thing. We are a changing people. Everything around us changes. This is why whenever I go back by my grandma's house, you know, she passed away on the day I came in view of a call here. I go by my grandma's house that's been sold now, and it just frustrates me because I have all these great memories of home. And I'm like, you, did, you tore the porch off? Psychopath, right? Like, it's not our home. But I'm upset that it's changed because I long for everything to be immutable instead of running to the one who is. Anytime we say I can't or I couldn't or I won't or I never, it's, all, uh, it's blasphemous that we're limiting the God who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever imagine. I just say it's the way I am. But God is the one who changes people. Let me ask you, are you guilty today of limiting what God can do? If you're the person who says, I can't, I, I would just, man, if I, if I had to walk in front of everyone, I just could never do that. You realize that's idolizing yourself. You can change, and God can change you. When we look at somebody and say, I, I just couldn't see God saving them, that's a lie from the pit of hell. God could take the most rotten sinner and save them and make them the greatest evangelist. Think of, I was thinking about it this way. There's not a person in this room that if it was God's will and being empowered by the Holy Spirit that wouldn't be a better preacher than Billy Graham. And, and that's not the way we think. But our God is able to take the loudmouth Peter and to change him. The Peter who drew his sword cut off a guy's ear to make him the one who comes to the temple and says, what I do have in the name of Jesus, stand up. God changes people. So that's Peter's problem, is that he's, he's really kind of stuck on himself here. I've never... And no, Lord. But here's the last thing I want you to see in the passage today. I want you to see God's provision for Peter. Look what happens. Verse 16. This happens three times. And immediately the sheet, the sheet was taken up. Now, so think, this sheet has dropped in front of him. And he said, uh, you know, get up, kill, and eat. And he said, no, no, Lord, I, I would never do that. Sheet disappears. It drops again. Get up, Peter. Kill, eat. And he says, nope, nope, that's unclean happens a third time. And then here's what happens. Verse 17, while Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent to, by Cornelius found him. Uh, Simon's house stopped at the gate. They called out asking for Simon. And look at verse 19. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, what happens in the moment that Peter is in the middle of his rebellion? The Holy Spirit speaks. Happens eight times. Eight times in the book of Acts that you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, and Peter hears one of them, and when does he hear it? Not when he's on the mountaintop. Here's the lie that I tell myself, is that if I'll get everything in order, if I'll, if I'll get my house in order, if I'll live in a, in a good, righteous life this week, then I'll hear the Lord. Then hearing his vision for me will be clearer. Now, don't get me wrong, because I do believe that, sound, uh, that sin kind of uh, clouds up your mind. It it frustrates your mind and your way of thinking. You, you begin to slip into this carnal way of thinking. So I don't want to mistake that. But there's never going to be a time where I have things in order enough that now God is going to speak to me. And here what we see is a great act of grace is that Peter, in the middle of his rebel rebellion, in, in the middle of him saying, you, you know, it's, it's his personality just exemplified. I, I didn't like your mode of salvation. I, I didn't like your model service. And I, I don't like your, your goal here in bringing everybody into you. It's in the middle of that that the Holy Spirit speaks to him. Isn't that great? I mean, you think about just what a picture of God's grace, that it's actually here, Peter, in the middle of his rebellion. And we didn't even talk about the three times that he denies Christ. You have this moment where Peter is not keeping in step with the Spirit. He's really kind of walking in the flesh. That the Spirit speaks to him and says, get up, Peter, and go welcome these brothers in. And I think I find that 
encouraging because sometimes when I'm seeking the will of God, I, I put so much strain on, have I got all these, have I got the three things in a row? Have I got the, the word of God and my heart's desire? And, and all, can, I, can I just make it good enough that now it's clear to realize that I want you to hear this. God's not trying to hide his will from anyone in this room. Isn't that great? Because if he was, I think this would be the time that Peter just missed it. That God would say, man, I, I wish Peter would have got his act together. So I could have told him to go to Cornelius. Peter's in the middle of rebellion. And God still reveals his will to him. Isn't that great? He doesn't want you to miss it. So here's God in his love and mercy speaking to Peter. Um, I, we ended last week talking about that, um, those leading lights. I read a, another story this week about George Mueller. If you remember George Mueller, just a, a wonderful evangelist, great missionary, um, recorded all of the miracles that he saw God do, was a great man of prayer, so you could read some of those if you'd like to look it up, but he just was continually a man of prayer. Uh, he said, I'm not going to solicit funds. I'm not going to ask people to give to my ministry. I'm just going to pray and let the Lord provide. And that's how he ran his whole ministry for years. Uh, never went to somebody and said, hey, could you help us buy bread? Got a cool story about him. Uh, you know, he had a bunch of orphans and he was praying they didn't have food. And so um, he just prays, Lord, would you provide the food? And somebody shows up at his door and says, we just had our, our order canceled for all the bread that I made today. Would you, would you take that? And then the milkman came by and said, um, not everyone was home today to, to to drop off the milk. Would you like this before it spoils? And, you know, it's just all these cool stories about how the Lord provided for George Mueller. He said this when he was asking about the will of God, kind of had some of the similar things that, uh, of the leading lights there. But here's one thing that he said different. He said, my number one step is this, to put my heart in neutral. Because my heart is so deceptive that whenever I say the word of God, and then I say the desires of my heart, and then I say circumstances, I can make my heart desire whatever I want. And sometimes it desires sinful things. So he said his first step whenever he's asking for the will of God is to say this, Lord, I'll do whatever you want. So would you help me to calm down my desires and to say, your will be done. To truly let me get to be that point where I say, whatever it is that you have. George Mueller, George Mueller went on to say, nine-tenths of the difficulties we have in hearing God is simply us overcoming our own heart's bias. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear to forgive them. You realize what they've done to me? I don't, I don't want to do that. I, you, you want me to sell everything? So if we can get our hearts to the point where we say, put our yes on the table. Lord, whatever you want, I'm just putting this in neutral. I'll do whatever you want. Proverbs 21 verse 1 says this, a king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and he directs it like water wherever he pleases. You remember when you were a kid and you'd build like little rock dams and you'd, you'd play with the water and you'd turn it in your hands? It's saying that what the Lord does is he takes men's hearts and he can steer them wherever he wants. He, look at Cornelius. Here you've got a Gentile that for some reason is praying and is for some reason giving alms to the poor. For some reason, here's a guy who fears God in a society that doesn't. It's to no benefit. It's not like he's a salesman and that he's trying to get some of the, the Jewish business in town, so he's trying to act the part, right? We used to have a guy that was a politician that'd visit Bus Buffalo Creek about a month before an election. I saw you little weasel. You want to come here to hear the word of God, praise the Lord, but if you're just here for votes, man, come on. That's not what this Cornelius is doing. God has directed his heart. Psalms 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. I think truly whenever the church gets back to the point to say, Lord, what we want is you. And whatever you want, that's what I want. Now, it's not Mother's Day, so I didn't share this joke last week, but I'll, I'll tell it now. If, if you've ever taken your wife out to eat and you say, what do you want? And she says, doesn't matter to me. And so you say, well, how about this restaurant? And she says, no, not that one. Yeah, I thought it didn't matter to you. How about this one? Nah, not, well, why don't you just pick? Because I can't, I'm running out of options, right? Thank you for being so gracious to me. No one laughed at that. That's because all the men were like, uh-uh, I ain't laughing at that. <laughs> nope, nope, that's not, I've never had that happen. 
Here's what it means for us as Christians that we say, Lord, I really want whatever you want. And I think as the church and as believers do that, the Lord begins to make it clear what he's called us to do. We don't want to be the type of people that have to have lightning strike for the Lord to get our attention. We want to be the ones that in humble submission we come to him and say, yes, Lord. Not like Peter did, no, Lord, but we say, yes, Lord, whatever the question is, you tell me. You know, we do this with baptism, don't we? I'll go wherever you tell me to go. I'll say whatever you tell me to say. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. And I'll trust your grace where I fall short. Because we know we'll need it. But even in that moment of grace, I want you to know God is a God that loves you and seeks to explain his will to you. Three questions as we close. Number one is this. Have I ever stood in opposition to the will of the Lord? Just like Peter said, no, Lord. Is that you? Is that something you need to repent of, a time that you said no to him? Number two, have you ever claimed yourself as immutable? I could never. Maybe there's that I could never statement that you need to crucify. I could never do that. Brother, you ought to crucify that and say, I I could do whatever the Lord calls me to do. And number three, third question would be this. Lord, would you direct my heart and guide my desires? A lot of questions about what God desires for us, but I can tell you one of God's desires that's clearly written in the word of God. God doesn't desire for any to perish, but all to come to repentance. I can tell if you're wondering what God's will is and you're not saved, I could tell you here's the first step. Be saved. That's God's will for every person in this room as they hear the gospel. I believe that's why God would bring us together is to hear that gospel. And then the last thing I want you to know as a believer, God's not hiding his will from you. He wants to reveal it. You submit your heart and listen for his voice. Father, we love you and we thank you for this day. We ask that you'd speak to us. For those who are saved, Father, I pray that you would continue to lead us and guide us. Father, would you continue to mold our hearts? Lord, we submit our will to you. We truly just want what you want. And Father, for those who are not saved, that have never come to you in faith and repentance. Father, would you reveal to them today that that's your desire for them, that you love them enough, even in their darkness, even in their hopelessness, that you desire them. We love you, Lord. Would you speak to us now? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.